Hi everyone and a warm welcome to you for another event in our Black History Year series. So my name is Dr Deborah Husband and I am a senior lecturer in psychology at the University of Westminster. I'll be hosting the event this afternoon on behalf of the Black History Year steering group at the University of Westminster and our guest joining us uh, today is Maxine Edgar. So Maxine is the founder and funeral director of Bronze Ash Funerals, along with her husband, Brian, and she has a real passion for the funeral industry. Uh, she spent a lot of her sort of working life, if you like, engaged in all of this, um, and she puts an emphasis on death culture and desires that the topic of death is better approached and not feared. So her knowledge of the industry is in depth, and she continues to perfect her understanding while embarking on further academic studies in that area, such as a master's degree in death, religion and culture, combined with ongoing studies in theology. So she comes to us well informed. So before I hand over to you, Maxine, um, I was doing a kind of quick tour, if you like, of death and how that's experienced in different cultures. So, for example, um, and I've got to credit John Frederick Wilson of York St. John University um, with this information. I found this on the conversation. Um, and essentially the article just sort of gives us an overview of how, how death and, and grieving is uh, experienced in different cultures. And in the Hindu culture, for example, it's an elaborate 13 day ritual uh, where um, if, the, if it's a, in the case of a widow, her place is then taken over by the eldest son's wife. Um, in Native American culture, uh, the death of a, a family member is experienced as collective grief, so everybody in the community feels that death. In Buddhism, the mourning period lasts for 49 days. Um, again, that is collectively experienced. So the process of grieving varies by culture, and in Bali, um, in terms of grieving, crying is frowned upon. So if you cry and your tears hit the, um, the, the body of the deceased person, then that is considered to be kind of disruptive for their transition to the afterlife. Where uh, in, in Egypt, as another example, grieving tearfully for after seven years is considered quite normal. If we contrast that with Western cultures, if someone was grieving after 12 months, that would be considered a disorder. Now, in some cultures, the body is kind of managed in different ways. Um, the dead body might be laid out, um, and uh, you know there, there are sort of variations even in the UK in terms of how the dead body is treated. Sometimes it's seen as a mark of respect for the body to be kept in the house, and people come and visit and pay their, uh, their respects. Um, and in other cultures, when a person is dead, there's a continuous connection with that dead person. It's a spiritual connection that continues. So with all of this kind of global variation around death and grieving, my question to you, Maxine, is how is grief experienced and treated in the Black community? Okay. Do you want me to go into that now or would you want to watch the slides? You can watch your slides. Thank you. Died at eventide, when the sun lay like a brooding sorrow above the western hills, veiling its face, when the wind spoke not, and the trees, great trees he loved, stood motionless. I saw his breath beating quicker and quicker. Then he paused, and then his little soul leapt like a star, and left a world of darkness in its train. The day changed not. The same tall trees peeped in at the windows. The same green grass glinted in the setting sun. Only in the chamber of death arrived the world's most piteous thing a childless mother. Hearken, O oh death, is not this my life hard enough? 
It's not that dull land that stretches its sneering web about me cold enough. It's not all the world beyond these four little walls, pitiless enough. But that thou must needs enter here. Thou, O oh death. Deborah, and thank you for the privilege of having me share my findings on death and our cultural practices within the Black community. Um, I've had to write a few notes because the, the, the subject is so vast um, and we only have a certain amount of time with which to cover most of the topics that I have here. And what you heard initially was a monologue um, from an account um, from American sociologist Du Bois. And he's given a, an account on the loss of his son, on the death of his son, um, from his book, When Black Souls Die. Yeah. And, and this account speaks from the heart of where he was as an individual mourning the loss of his son and also the loss, the, the bereavement of the black community. It drew a bond with grief, with loss. He's not dead, not dead, but escaped. Not bond, but free. From my findings from, uh, from the days of our enslavement until today, the practices 
and the belief systems are very much similar. Here, Du Bois's expression of grief was a bond between his individual loss and the experience of a collective community in Black America. It was a revelation of the cultural dimensions of Black experience with death and dying. And what we're going to do, we're going to go through some of the slides and, and I'm just going to share with you my findings, how we've got to where we are today and the similarities therein. So I'm just going to look at some slides now. After the monologue, you'd have seen there was a headstone of a slave. And that headstone states, paid black, born a slave, now free. Death, the burial process was not um, an automatic right for the enslaved. It depended upon their status, how their, their death, how their burial was handled. So if you're a house slave or a plantation slave, it would depend on how your body would be handled, i.e. if you're a house slave and were in favour with your master, he may give you a decent burial. You may be able to have a decent box and be buried in a sensible place and have a rock or a marker. I.e., if you, unlike the plantation slave, unfortunately, your carcass could be left there as a deterrent. It could have been thrown into a swamp, just left, or just thrown into some kind of box. It wasn't an automatic right. And slaves asked for this right for a burial because the, the, the burial was the one ritual, the one event that held them together. It was the one event where there was freedom. And also the homegoing ceremony was something to be celebrated. When we think of the life of the, the enslaved, the, the displacing, the, the brutality, yeah? the loss of identity. Death was a way out. And so it was celebrated and had to be celebrated in a particular fashion. It said here, and this was a point that I read, there was one thing which the Negro greatly insisted upon and which not even the most hard hearted masters were ever quite willing to deny them, that they could never bear that their dead could be put away without a funeral. And so funerals were held for slaves. And the way that they would work is in a very similar fashion to what we're still doing today. There would be an informal messenger that would beat the drums. It would be called the death call. And that death call would send word to the other plantations, giving them time to attend the funeral. And there would be groups up to 400 strong. The funerals would be held in hushed harbours and there were swamps, woodlands, near to the slave gatherings, nearer to where they lived, whereby they could conduct their rituals. And not far from, the, from where they lived, they would attend the hushed harbours and bury the deceased. You will see here, they would hold torches and they would sing songs and they would merry make. This was a time where you would have throngs of four or five hundred strong enslaved people and maybe two or three masters, slave masters, feeling under threat, may I add, because there was a time when they stopped the funerals, feeling under threat. They would sing songs, swing low, sweet chariot, begging for the death. And as we, we today, we do a similar kind of ritual where we will hold vigil, have wakes, um, and we'll come on to that later on. So this is what they would call a torchlight ceremony. And there would be a leader, some type of preacher that would come with the word. And they would take the body to the hushed harbour where the body would be buried and the men would shovel and fill the grave. A practice that we do even today, uh, it's not so much in America where they've got sepulchres and they've got electronic devices, but here in the UK, it is a practice that we fill the grave. It's called a witness in fill. And this is a practice that I believe that has carried on from the days of slavery. 
and you will see here that there is still the merrymaking and the dancing very much i mean as i look at this now i can see if you look on youtube you'll see videos of where we we carry out these practices some will call it a celebration of life well it was then it was a celebration of death okay we can we can move on once the 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 the, the grave had been filled and the men had filled the grave you can see here they've got the um the shovels here and the rituals have been performed what they will do is they would hang cups and saucers and familiar objects onto the grave and these objects were to ensure that the spirit didn't come looking for their bits and pieces in the home yeah but would return to the grave sometimes they'd even pass a child over the grave this is something that they still do now I believe even in the Caribbean, they will pass a baby over to the grave and so the spirit would protect the baby. But even now with some of these procedures and, and, and rituals, it's said that on the ninth night, which we'll come to in, in, in one of the um, slides, on the ninth night, the spirit has to be banished. But it's expected that the, the, the spouse of the deceased, especially if it's a husband that died um, and, and, the, and the woman um, is still alive, she would be expected to turn her underwear inside out, turn her bed around, so that when the, the husband came looking, he would not find his wife. And it's really funny how quite often it's always the man with these myths and fables, always the man, not the woman that dies. Um, and it's indicative of the high percentage of males that died um, during enslavement. Uh, a wife would wake up and he'd just be gone. No questions asked, no one to answer to, he'd just be gone. Indicative of the black man being taken away or the black man disappearing even onto today. So that was also a practice. Also red underwear is something that, that's favorable now. I don't know why red but this is also to ward the spirit away. So very familiar practices that we have today. We can move on with the videos. When the enslaved became free and had some money of their own and would approach the white undertakers, they didn't want to know. They didn't want to know. What they would do is they would, um, send them around the back. Uh, they wouldn't embalm them. It was a substandard service. This is now in America. The hearses were broken down. Even, even when there was money to be paid, uh, the black man was still not accepted. And so they pulled together. If we can have the next slide. Thank you, Dominica. Pulled together as black undertakers uh, and many of the undertakers and I mean all undertakers they started with um, carpenters carpenters who could build boxes and build coffins this is black and white um, and you'll find that the history when you look to the history of many undertakers they were cough they were coffin makers yeah woodworkers cabinet makers that kind of thing so when Blacks had enough money of their own, they pulled together and they created their own funeral homes. And what they would do is they would offer one another the finest. So it was the finest casket because they had been deprived during enslavement, they would create the finest. So they wouldn't be, you'll see here with all the sil silver and the, the metal work and the carvings, even until today caskets that's that's what they would give one another the, the the black funeral director was the hub of the community and also social activists for the black community they were a voice because they were not allowed to be part of the federations this is actually my uncle's funeral a couple of years ago uh, the black funeral director was not part was not allowed to be part of the white federations they were still at the bottom of the list they were still rejected but they became the hub of society they became the mediators the barristers the judges and also the start of entrepreneurship within 
the black community because this is the one thing that the black community have always done well and that is funerals we can have the next slide please and even today you'll see how we have memorization this is another way of how we handle our grief with the memorization and we have the the, the pamphlet sometimes they're a4 12 pages strong depicting the deceased as almost celebrity that's what the memorization does that's how we you see here that's actually my uncle he liked bells on the front of that there was a jamaican flag so it was representative of him and the life that that he lived thank you and we'll move on to the next slide. So here we have a viewing, and those are his, um, I guess his nephew viewing. What we also have um, from, from historically, there are certain, certain, certain practices and rituals. The opening of the coffin is one of them. You know, as soon as the individual dies, they are embalmed, automatically embalmed. And we have what we call casket sharp. You are to look your finest in your casket. Yeah, you're going home to glory. You're going to meet your maker. You can't be shabby. Women normally were dressed in white, head tied in white. You'll see the white satin on the, on the coffin. Casket sharp, your finest. And it was said that if a casket was closed, the funeral director had not done a very good job and that's one of the things you'll find if you ever attend a black funeral and they open the coffin everybody wants to look and I mean practice is something that we've been doing for years and years everybody wants to look everybody wants to see thank you so what we have here is the drummers and um, I didn't get the chance to do it but what you would hear is you heard the original drumming um, earlier on in the in the frame, but later on now we are still playing those tunes at the nine night. And the nine night was a vigil or a wake that will be held over a period of nine nights after the death of the deceased. Years ago, obviously because of the weather, people will be buried much sooner. Now you're nine nights and you've still got months left before the deceased, what with bridges and embalmers, deaths are taking longer they're becoming more elaborate so the nine nights are recurring and the funerals are not taking place however the nine night used to be an evening of jokes of dancing nothing to do with god nine nights are not scriptural they're not biblical nine nights are telling ghost jokes old stories and songs and a time of gathering and keeping up the family until the ninth night and then you would have a setup on that night and you would set up, you know, all night long. Very similar practices we still uphold today. And if you can see here, they've got Thanksgiving tables that they used to have where they'd, they'd put out food and fruits. And that's very similar in some of the Buddhist cultures for the, for the spirit of the deceased. And you can see they've got the, the familiar clothing on. That was what the nine night was about. Nowadays, it's changed somewhat. It's a generational thing. People are more having parties and celebrations on the nine night. And here you can see another viewing, viewing of the deceased, which is something, um, something that, that, that we, we, we just do. People just want to see the deceased. Um, I found now that with a changing generation, fewer of that younger generation, they're quite happy to spend time with the deceased once they have died, as opposed to opening the coffin in, in the church. We had a funeral for a baby today and the parents spent time with him when he died um, and, and didn't see him again. Um, but the, the viewing is very, very popular. And in some cultures I find, especially with the African um, community, they must view, irrespective of the condition of the body, whether it's been embalmed, whether you've had it three months, they must view. And here again, we have Casket Sharp, Aretha Franklin, uh, who had three different um, changes of clothing during her 
three-day um, memorial, might I ask, that's what it was. And here you'll see the Profumium 30,000 pound golden casket, steel gorge sealed. Um, that's what she had, casket sharp. You're going home to glory, you're in your finest, you've got to look your best. And we'll have the next one, please. That's actually the, the, the casket uh, for Michael Jackson. That's Michael Jackson's casket, which remained closed. I think also more and more people are being considerate. This actually was the casket for George Floyd, who was murdered by asphyxiation and who was changed the course of the world. George Floyd was given the, the funeral of a statesman and many people wondered why, why, why could this person who was a nobody, apparently, I say apparently a thief and a drug addict, um, who was thought to be in suspicious circumstances, have a funeral on such a large scale and where did the money come from? What, <laughs> it is really difficult to, to, to explain, but the reality is what we say, and here again, that's George Floyd's coffin. The system and the life of the black man in today's world is very, very difficult. And we know that there have been many losses and crosses. We still mourn the black man. I think this is another conversation maybe for another day, but we still mourn the, the, the slave that was sent away from home, that the, the husband that was displaced, the husband from the Windrush that came and went elsewhere. There's that, that missing black man that we still mourn. And the decisions that he made because of the system and where his life ended up. Decisions that he made. But what we say when you're in your coffin, when you're in your purity, when you're in your space, that gold profumian 30,000 pound casket eradicated that thug and that brute culture that has been assigned to him. No longer a thug, no longer a brute, no longer a drug addict, no longer a Mr. Nobody, no longer a slave. You are now a king in your space, George Floyd. You are now free. That is the message that that casket gives out. That same message that stems from slavery, no longer enslaved, no longer a bondage to sin, you are free. Hence, that type of funeral that was given to him in his death and in his space, he is now a king. Next one, thank you. And so what we have many different types of rituals today. This one is, is a growing trend, might I ask, in America, and it's called the crowning ceremony. Um, and there's much speculation as to where this crown in ceremony stems from. There's a scripture in the Bible that says, you know, you'll wear, you'll wear a crown of glory um, when you die. Um, I'm, I'm just paraphrasing now. So many ascribe it to, to, to that time. So you shall wear a crown. And what we have is we have these, um, I, should, I should say they're artisans, aren't they? They're performers and they walk in with the crown. They do a type of slow moving dance. They literally open up the casket and they put the crown, the crown which has been purchased by the family onto the head of the deceased. So in that space, I'm of the mind that that crown in ceremony actually stems from kings and queens and prince and princesses that were robbed of their rightful positions, yeah? Robbed of their rightful positions, left bereft, if I might add. And now, now in your space, you shall wear that crown, that crown. The only God, that's the belief, the only God can give to you. Thank you. quite elaborate. And the next slide, please. And here we have the t-shirt culture, which is still very much part of what we're doing and very, very popular now. And what the t-shirt the culture does, I mean, in the 
years ago with the t-shirt you'd have a face of a celebrity on it this is all now forms part of the celebrity status the t-shirt culture actually started um with gangland violence and gangland deaths so the person that died would be put on the front of the of the t-shirt and everybody would wear them they, they they have them printed up and they sell them memorizing the person giving them that celebrity status and as you can see also decorating and the wrapping of the coffin we've been asked to do one today in my funeral home is also um another form of memorization and how we handle death how we deal with death thank you Yeah, so, so many of these, are, I've, I've, um, we, we, we struggle to say goodbye and, 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 and death, death is something that we will all experience. Obviously, we're all going to die, but within our families and within our homes and each of us, it's relative. How we deal with our death differs greatly. However, within the, the Black community, I remember years ago, someone saying to me, oh, you all, you all have a good time. You, you know, you'll celebrate life. I said, well, we do celebrate life. We are an emotional people, but we actually all feel the same. We all actually feel the same, but we execute our feelings and our rituals and our rites of passage differently. From my experience of, of, of death within our, our, our culture, I look back to the time of slavery where we there was that open invitation, open invitation to just come and to sit and, and to share together. The, the, the funeral for the enslaved was the most important thing that could happen because it was either slavery on a daily basis work or a funeral. There was no in between. And today, when I look at the black community and culturally, when I see because of you know, the way things have gone um, and, and we are in default as a community, funerals are very much similar. I look at a lot of the, the men that attend there, a lot of the people that attend, single people, single people, lonely people. It's a time for us to come together. It's a time for fellowship. And whilst that, that relationship with, with faith is not the same because we, we're in a different generation now. 20 years ago, I, when my mother died, I wouldn't have dreamt of, of, of cremating my mum. I wouldn't have dreamt. 85% of funerals in the UK are cremations. I wouldn't have dreamt of it. A couple of years ago, when my uncle died, it was thought of, should we cremate him? because the attachment and the association with being raised from the dead, even if they weren't believers, was still there. And, you know, we, we had a funeral on Monday and they, they still did their rituals of pouring the brandy into the grave and have a drink on me. You've gone home to glory. So there's still that mindset. There are few humanists, very few humanists um, in the black community. There are atheists. The vast majority have some type of belief system, but you will find when there is a funeral, we come together for 500 strong and we're all in one place, togetherness, one people. It's the one thing that we do very well and we enjoy it. We enjoy it. The way that we deal with that, with the death and, and, and facing the truth, we attended a nine night on um, Sunday night. It was said that there was 1,200 people there. Had you have gone in blindly, not realising it was a nine night, you'd have been under the illusion it was a massive party. Well, it was. However, each individual who knew the deceased was grieving. It manifested differently but they were in their grief. And that's how we do death. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maxine. Um, really, really interesting thoughts and observations and, and obviously drawing on your own experiences as well. Um, I really appreciated the situation of death, bereavement, grief 
within the kind of historical context of slavery <clears throat> and how that has essentially informed the way we do death um, uh, and you know that those customs and practices are really important connections for us in terms of our our black identity. Um, I wanted to, to ask you a couple of questions and we've got some questions that have been sent by our audience as well. So um, one observation is that, that there seem to be some clear gendered practices in the way sort of funeral rights um, and, and, and behaviors are, are managed. Um, very much a sort of male dominated area. Now I'm looking at you as a, a female um, funeral director, and I'm wondering how, how is that all changing? How are you seeing sort of changes in terms of, you know, the gendered um, position of, of managing deaths compared to how it is now with someone like yourself being in, you know, as part of that? Okay, that's a really, really good question because the reality is it was the women, it always was the women that handled death in all communities. So if you'd have gone to Wales one side, if you'd have gone to the Caribbean, if you'd have gone to Africa, the body would die, the body would stay at home, the women would wash the body down, lay it out, wrap it up in clothing, put coffee all over it until the funeral came to stem the smell. And it was the women, the men would just build the coffins. So there's a change in place in funerals at the moment throughout the UK, yeah. where more and more females, more women are going into the industry. And we actually have two or three female funeral directors that are run by women, four or five women, no men. Completely. This is a change in place. It's a type. It's a new thing. They're all green green funerals, natural funerals, because that's the way the deaths are going. But the, 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 the female funeral director is very much prevalent, happening right now. It's difficult. It's difficult because the funeral, di the, the, the funeral directors that we've come to now are white middle class men um, in their 50s and 60s, and they have a monopoly. The bigger firms are all run by men. Um, and, and it's quite funny, actually, because the female firms are hated by the men because it's the new way. And hate comes out of fear, doesn't it? Hate, that's where fear's rooted in, in hate. Fear of being taken over. Yeah. And so that's where we are right now. But the women are doing exceptionally well. And also women bring business. Mm. women bring business because there is that compassion I'm not saying men don't have it because they do but for so long the funeral director has been monopolized by just like straight down the middle this is a business you know and and you know not tick off everything as we go along yeah. but a woman will sit down and talk with you will cry with you will demonstrate compassion mm. you understand mm. and that is what it is it's no longer just the business and, and the funeral homes that, that, that these undertakers had, the, the black undertakers, the early undertakers, they were the hub of the society for the black community. It was more than just coming into the funeral home to, to have a funeral. It was a place of love, a place of care. It was a bank. You could get your funeral on credit because we were not getting the care that we needed as black people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So a lot of your, your presentation centered on slavery. Um, and, you know, we, we sort of really explained a lot of the practices that existed um, around that time. And we've got a, a, a question, I suppose, from Cheryl, um, that it was it's strange that slavery, she's saying, is such a feature in these practices, or, or why it should even be the starting point because our culture is bigger than the last 400 years so do we draw on anything outside of slavery beyond slavery um the pra practices of you know sort of uh, uh, we know the nubians for example are there practices that were carried in slavery that have then 
become perpetuated through the generations? Where is the, is there a starting point for all of this? Do we start at slavery or do we look beyond that? Well, we start at slavery, look beyond slavery, be, before slavery, who sets the benchmark? Who sets a benchmark for a practice that well, where, where is the harm in continuing something that is so great? Mm. Slavery per se was a terrible time, but not all the practices that we developed during that time. And I mean, by in a process of default, we were forced to, to, to create a pattern of funerals. Do you understand? It wasn't a case of, oh, we are slaves, let's sit down. We were in default. We created a pattern of funerals, many of which we still mimic today. And it's mm -hmm. funny that that, that that is said because much of what we do, we don't know why we're doing it. We don't know why we have the nine nights. We don't know why we have the drums. We can connect drums to Africa. Do you mm -hmm. understand? We don't know why we, why we wear white. You know, so, so it's an association. It's a correlation, a relationship between then and now and why we are still doing the same things. Not that we should, but we do. Who sets the benchmark? Who do we follow? The Western world? I mean, I quite enjoy our practices and our rituals. Um, and and, and I, I'm really, really happy that we are still carrying them out. What, what I do think is important that we understand what we're doing and why we are doing certain things. Why? You know, throughout, I mean, if you think about slavery only a couple of hundred years ago, mm -hmm. and for many of us, it's just like two or three generations away, you know? So there are still many practices, even when you go to the Caribbean, that, that have been, you know, that, that they're still doing, that have been executed since slavery. So mm -hmm. yeah, I understand. Um, I, I enjoy the practices. Thank you. So uh, a question here, from from Debbie and uh, this is really all around the, some of those practices that you've mentioned so the, the viewing of the dead so where specifically does that come from is that something that slaves would have done would they have had the time to have a body on display and everybody yeah, come yeah. And view or is yeah. that something that's evolved more yeah. recently no 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 so what the slave would do is so the person would die immediately when the person would die the women would take the body wash the body dress them up in white, the body would be laid down and they would sit around the body, touching the body, telling jokes, just like awake, awake. You know, the term awake is you kept awake with the body and with the family until the funeral. So that was something that was always done. Yeah, um, the body just sat in the, and you'll find that um, it's really, really funny because I was a celebrant, I was a funeral celebrant. Um, and the funeral celebrant is a minister, religious or non-religious, some people call us humanists, I'm not a humanist, that will take ceremonies in chapels and so forth. And of my group that are celebrants, they're all white, they've done many more funerals than I would ever do. None of them have ever seen a body. Even as a celebrant, none of them had ever seen a body. It wasn't a practice, um, or isn't a practice. I mean, you have viewings, they have viewings in the, mm -hmm. the chapel of rest, but the open coffin is not really something that, mm -hmm. that the, um, the English community do, but, yeah. but we do, although there is less of it now. But casket sharp is very American. Yes, so, and this is something that I picked up in, in a lot of those practices that I was seeing there and this idea of the crown and so on, that they seem to be very US centric sort of yes. practices and very flamboyant and, you know, it's, it's like a New Orleans type funeral with the jazz band and all of that, you know, this, this massive sort of celebration and a, a whole kind, of, it's almost like a coronation the way, you know, it was sort of described, the crowning as it were. Uh, and I'm just wondering uh, in terms of, you know, contrasting similarities and similarities, how much have we sort of borrowed from the US in our current practices and, and how much of, of them are authentically Caribbean slash African? Okay, so I think when I when we say we, if we think about the UK, because we are following on, we follow on. Um, much of the families that come and sit in front of me and they say, oh, we want to embalm, and I ask, well, why? 
What does embalming mean to you? What does that entail? You want a casket? Tell me why. Because they look. I think as a people, and even I don't want to make sweeping or general statements, we tend to do the same thing. So you've got America. If you go to funerals in Jamaica, they are very similar. If you look at the graveyards, the older graveyards in Jamaica, like Dovecot, they build houses, little mini houses for the deceased. You can literally go in them. They're like little Wendy houses, yeah? Over in America now, the headstones are plaques. They've got smaller. So that fussiness has all gone. Now, if you remember in the early days, you'd be, you'd be buried on your land in the Caribbean. That's a practice that they're kind of ruling out now simply because the land's not necessarily safe and also the houses can't be sold because they're big tombs, yeah? So you've got the graveyards in Dovecot that are falling apart. It's not a practice for them to go back. Once you're buried, that's it. They don't visit the cemetery of flowers like us, yeah? But what they have in America, as I said, they've got the plaques and it's all very uniform, all right? Well, they have that now in the Caribbean. They have that. I was in the Caribbean in February and I was in a meadow rest funeral home and you can look across. There are no high headstones or memorabilia now. It's all very much the same. And we are doing a similar thing here now yeah, in the yeah. UK where funeral, where the, the memora, memorabilia, the, the, the headstones have to be of a certain height and a certain colour and uniformed. Right. So I, I think we tend to follow on, follow on, not necessarily as a people, but generally speaking, nations. Oh, oh. I'm going to go to a question from Cassius. Um, and uh, this is, uh, it's interesting that it's called the celebration of, of death. Um, and now we, we, we're so familiar with celebrations of life, you know, the kind of terminology around death seems to be changing. Um, but do you think that, that there is more or less spirituality or spiritual practices with funerals today? Okay, so spiritual is subjective, whatever spiritual is, okay? Um, if we can talk about, first of all, faith and religion, um, it, it, it really depends on, I, I think it's a generational thing. I'm finding more and more people want less religion. I personally, as a minister and as a celebrant, one of the reasons I became a minister because I was fed up of going into churches and hearing people say this one's gone to heaven and this one came to church and the Lord said this and we prayed for this when it wasn't true. Last time I saw that bloke, he had a bottle of rum and a spliff and whatever. It just wasn't true. Yeah. And I believe that in death, we need to give a true, true presentation. Yeah. Of, of the person as they lived within reason, with boundaries, with integrity. Yeah. And being diplomatic. Yeah. So armed with that knowledge, funerals are theatre. They are theatre. They are a performance from the guy who pages in front of the coffin, which is an English thing, walking in front of the coffin and bowing before the family and all of that. to when the coffin is lowered, it's theatre. And what we're doing now, we have more going on in terms of presentations and a depiction of the life of the person. So yes, less spiritual, yeah. less spiritual. Mm -hmm. So some of the rituals that you've mentioned, especially the joyful ones, um, do they exist across religions in black communities? So oh. this question is posed to us by Andreas and um, they're thinking of sort of Muslim and Jewish communities in particular. So do we have sort of a, a similarity across the different sort of religions that exist in black communities? I don't know if we have um, a similar, um, I think many of what we've done, we have shaped and fashioned many practices but, and, and developed practices that quite possibly didn't exist. We've kind of introduced new practices ourselves as, as a people um, into our mourning process and handling death. I don't think we share, we did our own bodies. Buddhist funeral the other day in the cemetery in which they put money into the grave because it's believed that the individual will need money in their afterlife. I've seen that within our community. I've seen, you know, drink 
the things that the person would like, but not believing that they will need them, but comfort for ourselves, if that makes sense, which quite often I say to people, this is for you. This is how we control our grief, yeah? And control death mm -hmm. by offering these, these things mm -hmm. to the deceased who has no need for them, if that makes sense. Yeah, so we've culturalized things, we've culturalized. Yeah. And it's interesting that you're talking about sort of grief um, and, and how we deal with that. And I think even the language around grief seems to be changing because you use the term there that, you know, controlling grief, whereas um, I'm sort of getting a sense now it's about sort of just allowing grief to do its thing, whatever that would look like in an, in an individual. Um, and as I sort of said right at the beginning, different communities, if you're grieving for a very long period of time, it's seen as natural. In another one, it's seen as unnatural and so on. Um, in, in, in the season of sorrow, and this is a question from um, Cheryl, lots of people are struggling to know how to move on in, in the different stages of grief and mourning. Um, and I'm just wondering if, you know, you have any advice given, you know, that you've seen probably the full spectrum of the presentation of grief uh, and mourning, if there's advice that you would give to people in terms of how they might want to think about handling grief. Um, I know particularly, you know, we had the COVID period uh, and I've never seen so many hearses going up and down the road. Um, you know, during that period, it was so intense and you just about managed to get over the sense of loss of one person and then you were on to someone else. How, how do we move through grief? What's your perspective on that? Well, number one, I'm glad you said move through and not move on. Mm. You understand? Move through and not move on, all right? Grief is relative. Grief is loss, okay? Not just loss of someone or something yeah but a loss of self mm -hmm. and whatever relationship you would have had with that thing or person mm -hmm. all right grief is a personal a personal position that only you can negotiate mm -hmm. when it comes to grief I don't believe another person, yeah, another person, i.e. myself, can say to someone, this is what you do, or this is how you do it. And I'll say this, I, as a funeral director, and I'll say it to everyone, my job is a mediator, my job is a counsellor, my job is a barrister, my job is a referee, my a judge. I stand in the office like that. They're fighting left, right and centre. There's pain, there's anger. Literally 70% of my families, it's nothing new. It's grief, it's loss, it's confusion. And unfortunately, because, and I have to play, I have to, I have to mention it, because of who we are as a people, our grief is different. We grieve differently because we are born in grief because we haven't moved on. Does that make sense? We haven't moved on as a people, all right? So we've got grief, encompassing grief, encompassing grief, and we cannot get out of it, you know? And when we think of being bereaved or when we're thinking of grief, we're thinking about something that has happened. But grief can be a time in moment, in a situation that we hold on to something that we remember, not necessarily loss, if that makes sense to you, all right? And so for, for our community, and, 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 and I have to stress this, you're never good enough, you're never quite right. As a woman, you're usually the help in the workplace, yeah? You miss out on the opportunities. When you do get the opportunities, you can't even share it with your black counterparts. For, 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 for fear of reprisal, for fear of pain. Do you understand? You turn left, you turn right. That is the grief. So, so when, when we're faced with a situation of death, yeah, you're trying to meander your way out of your grief, of your loss for someone that you loved and you cared about, 
but everything else that's on top of that. And without getting too personal, yeah, there are accounts of stories, even a gentleman that I know that had died last week that's coming into my coming in very soon. And 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 he's just left a catalogue of errors, not by his own fault, but because of the system that he's in. They can't even grieve because they are grieving as a family for the problems that have been created, if that makes sense. They can't even get to the place where they're saying this loved one has died because of everything that was around him when he was alive. It's ever so sad. With COVID, we have become desensitized to death. We've become desensitized to death. I lost a, a great friend, a mentor, a bit older than me, someone that I love dearly. And when I got the phone call that she died, she didn't die during COVID, she died last year. It was almost as though, okay, another death. Had COVID have not happened, I would have proved differently. I now accept, well, you know, she's gone. And I can move on, yeah? I'm not saying people have to move on. And, and I, you move on, you deal with your grief in your, your own time. I don't think there's any right way or wrong way. I think you have to learn how to manage, manage your grief manage your grief yeah you have to look at you know why am i grieving am i grieving for the future that i had with this man we were going to run off into the midst or with this woman or you know am i grieving for the daily walks that i took with because it could be your dog that i took with my dog what am i going to do with my time or do i miss the dog do you understand what i'm saying you have to come to times where you understand what is my grief yeah is it that because the reality is it's not we are not made to grieve forever. And you'll notice that. You'll see somebody crying one minute and then you'll see them spinning on their head and dancing the next. We can't grieve for long periods of time. We're not made that way. It brings on depression. So there are coping mechanisms, a way in which we can manage it. But grief actually remains forever. It's managed. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. So, you know, this kind of also throws up the fact that uh, in our workplaces, uh, our institutions, organisations, wherever it is we spend most of our day, um, that the, the handling of grief tends to be very corporate. So there's sort of strict rules around it. You'll have, a, you know, we'll give you three days off to, to deal with that, if it's a close family member or what have you. Um, and I know that for people from, you know, various cultures, the way that they, they some of them have some real, um, kind of cultural responsibilities that must be fulfilled on the death of a loved one. It's a matter of shame and, 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 and dishonor if they, if they don't do that. So the, the complexity of grief is something that I think, you know, our, our employers generally fail to understand. They fail to understand the cultural complexity of grief. And there's a kind of a blueprint for this is how you grieve. Uh, and then once you've had your two or three days, then you move on. And what you're clearly saying is that grief is a, a multifaceted construction and it is experienced by people in so many different ways. So thank you for just bringing that to prominence. And I want to conclude by just asking you a question. So you're surrounded by grief. You're surrounded by dead people, as it were, um, because of your profession. How do you how do you manage bone kind of feelings within that, that environment? How does it impact you? My heart breaks. My heart breaks. It, it does. My heart breaks. We have two friends now, um, friends, personal friends, similar age, um, in, 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 in the fridge, in my shop now. My heart breaks. It's sad. One one came in the other day, our friend Cyril, I had to jump back and, and come out. I can't believe, I can't believe he's in the shop. However, <clears throat> I'm a believer and God has given me a grace. He has given me a grace to be able to stand, all right? Um, in, in, in many ways, I've given you all my different jobs. The funeral director comes at the bottom, yeah? I can wash them, I can dress them, I can care for them. I can tend to the families, I can speak to them. God has given me a grace. It is a calling on my life, yeah? 
being a funeral director is more than just going into the job, taking money and, and, and attending the funeral. Yeah, I am passionate about people. I'm passionate about the living. I go and I check their faces every day that they haven't changed in the mortuary. It's important to me that the people see their loved ones, yeah, in a fashion that they expect. You know, the, the little bits and pieces, the little touches that are important. It's important to me that loved ones are cared for. And it is the grace of God that keeps me. You can't get up one morning and say, oh, I want to be a funeral director. You can try, but it won't last. You have to have that passion and there has to be a calling on your life. And yeah, it, it, it's fine. My heart breaks and then I move on. I feel the same. I feel the same. You know, it doesn't, you know, the sadness we had the baby today, he was all wrapped up before I placed him in the coffin. I had to look at him a final time. I had to look at his face a final time. You know, it was important to me. It wasn't okay. And nobody would know. Some of the things that we do, nobody would know. Nobody has to know, you know, but it's personal to me. And I believe that I've been given a role to execute and I have to execute it to the best of my ability. And I love the work and I love the people. Thank you so much, Maxine. Um, you know, what, what you've shared with us is, is, is deeply personal, um, but deeply important. And it's, it's clear that death at some point, if it hasn't touched us yet, it's going to touch us at some point. We're going to be in the place where we are grieving um, and we're going to have to find ways to, to handle, like you say, to manage the grief and to go through the process. I want to thank you for sharing a really interesting um, talk with us this evening. Um, I, I personally have learned so much about, you know, the kind of historical connections of why we do the things we do around death uh, and grieving in the Black community. Um, and I'm hoping that for uh, our attendees this evening that you too have learned something. Thank you so much for the questions that you have fed through that I've been able to pose to Maxine this evening. Uh, on behalf of the Black History Steering Group, thank you again for coming. Uh, this event will be recorded and it will be hosted on our Black History Year blog. And uh, I think the link will be put in the chat to, uh, so that you can access that. And also the, the university's YouTube channel. So it doesn't come on stream immediately. We have to kind of render and process. And then uh, I should think in about a week's time, it should be available for viewing. So just to finish by saying um, that our next event is Life After Windrush. And that's on the 21st of June at 6 p.m. And we are going to be privileged with hearing from two speakers who will share their experiences of life post Windrush, but obviously reflecting as well on what the, the whole kind of Windrush period meant for them in terms of their identities. So the link for that will be placed in the chat and you can register for that via the blog site as well. So a final thank you to Maxine for being thank with you. us this evening. We've really enjoyed listening to you. Thank you again to our guests and I hope you all have a good evening. Thank you.